Hello, my name is Mathieu Kinch. I'm an associate professor at INSA Lyon, and I'm going to present you a joint work with my former PhD student, Guillaume Celosia. So this work is about uh, uh, Bluetooth low energy uh, continuity protocols um, that are used by Apple devices and the kind of uh, privacy issues that you may have with those protocols. So first, what are Apple continuity protocols? So Apple continuity is a family of services uh, provided by Apple devices such as AirDrop, uh, Apple Pay, Instant Hotspot, um, EndOff. So EndOff is a, a tool that can use to transfer one activity such as writing an email from one device uh, to the other. So those continuity protocols, the main purpose is to enable interaction between uh, nearby devices. And how it works in practice is that they leverage uh, Bluetooth communication to carry uh, information between nearby devices. So it's more specifically, it's Bluetooth low energy that is used here. So if you need to transfer an activity from one smartphone to your laptop, uh, this will be done by uh, transferring some data over Bluetooth low energy. So more particularly, uh, what kind of messages are uh, used for that? Um, they use uh, um, Bluetooth uh, low energy advertisement packets. So those packets are transmitted periodically by Bluetooth low energy devices uh, in order to announce their presence. But in addition, uh, the Bluetooth consortium uh, enable the possibility to include custom data in those packets. Uh, inside the manufacturer specific uh, fields. And this is what Apple did. So they use this manufacturer specific field to include uh, their data uh, used by continuity protocols. So inside the fields uh, used by Apple, you will find uh, continuity messages, potentially several of them uh, inside this, this same field. And each of those continuity messages uh, will follow um, a type length data format. So those uh, messages, uh, they are broadcasted uh, in clear. So there is no encryption uh, on that. Um, means that the information is available to any eavesdropper. And this has been noticed by several works that have identified um, serious privacy issues associated with uh, the use of continuity protocols. Um, most of those works, they present uh, tracking attacks uh, in which an attacker can track a device over time because there are some identifiers that are included in those messages. However, uh, those work, they only discovered the tip of the iceberg uh, with regard to privacy issues uh, because they only add a partial understanding of the messages. Um, and uh, what we did in our work is to uh, reveal the rest uh, of the iceberg uh, by uh, discovering the, the full uh, meaning of the continuity messages. So we wanted to understand uh, what were those continuity messages, meaning uh, to basically understand the language of uh, Apple devices, uh, how they talk over Bluetooth. The problem is that those messages, um, there is no public documentation about it. So there is little information, the software is closed source and you will find no documentation almost from Apple. So what we did is we had recourse to reverse engineering to understand what were the meaning of those messages. We first had a look at um, Apple debugging tools to reverse engineering those uh, messages. Uh, then we also crafted our own continuity messages. And finally, uh, we made a bit of uh, disassembly of some of the binaries uh, involved in continuity protocols. So the first tool that we uh, used uh, was provided by Apple. It's called Packet Logger and Packet Decoder. It's a debugging tool uh, that will um, pass and log messages uh, incoming on your device, including the Bluetooth uh, messages. So for each message, you will have uh, the meaning of the message as well as some potential actions that are triggered by the reception. So it was really useful to get a first glimpse of uh, what were those uh, messages about. Then um, we had recourse to uh, crafting our own uh, continuity messages. 
So using HCI tool, uh, we generated uh, custom messages based on the templates of messages we've already uh, observed. And we sent, we broadcasted um, those messages over the air. And we observe um, action that were potentially triggered uh, on nearby devices. But most importantly, we had a look at the, how they were interpreted by packet logger. So this was another uh, good source of uh, information to understand. Uh, the meaning of those messages. And finally, uh, we did some disassembly. So we selected a number of binaries, and uh, such as uh, call speech used by the Siri voice assistant, sharing D involved in the airdrop functionalities, also packet decoder and packet logger, the two tools I've talked about, and other softwares like uh, HomeKit Accessory Simulator. And what we had it was pretty neat. Uh, we managed to get um, the information on all the messages. Uh, so the format of those messages, but most importantly, uh, the meaning of the codes. So for instance, in this, our case here, what I'm presenting, the code I'm presenting is related to the passing of uh, one message that is called action and can have uh, many types. Uh, here I'm just linked, listing the first types of this uh, uh, message. Uh, so for instance, if the value is uh, three, it's for mobile backup, four, it's for watch setup, and five, it's for Apple TV pair. So we had, uh, thanks to those uh, three approaches, we managed to get a um, I mean, pretty good view. And what I can say is almost all the, uh, we, we basically understood everything, uh, all the language of uh, Apple continuity. So what we add was um, the understanding of all the messages. Uh, so we had a total of 10 messages type. Um, for each message, we have the format of the message, so different fields composing this message, and also for each field, uh, the meaning of the code. Sometimes you have some codes in there. Uh, so a lot of information uh, that is uh, listed uh, and available inside uh, our paper. So now we understand uh, fully the language of uh, Apple devices and we are ready to start uh, investigating for potential privacy and security issues. So we discovered many things, uh, but in this presentation, I'm just going to talk about four of them. Uh, physical tracking, so how you can track users, uh, spying, how we can spy on the smart home activity, uh, how uh, some emails and phone numbers are leaked, and finally, uh, the case of uh, Siri spoken comments. So let's start with the physical tracking. Uh, so physical tracking uh, of uh, BLE devices and their users is possible because um, uh, those uh, devices, they broadcast periodically advertisement packets, the packets in which uh, Apple continuity are, uh, messages are included. And those uh, messages, uh, like any Bluetooth messages, they include a device uh, address, um, which could be used to track the user, uh, the device and the user over time. So to uh, limit this risk, um, the Bluetooth consortium has included inside the specification uh, the possibility to use uh, random addresses instead of the real address. So. Periodically, the device will switch to a new random address uh, and doing so, it will prevent uh, any passive attacker from tracking the device over time based on the device address. So this is a good thing, but uh, this is only about the device address and many works have shown that if you include uh, all the data inside those advertising packets, uh, your device uh, could still be tracked. For instance, uh, inside um, uh, continuity messages, we identify that uh, the AirPod, message, uh, AirPod devices, um, and along with the case, uh, broadcast uh, continuity messages in which you have information about the state of the uh, AirPod sets. So basically, the battery state and the number of time the case has been opened. Uh, and all this is advertised in clear, of course. Uh, 
Um, so here uh, we presented on this figure uh, the evolution of um, the device address, how it changes over time. So the vertical uh, gray and white stripes are the device address changes. So the device address is changing every approximately 15 minutes. And you can also see uh, the lead open counter and the different battery levels of the device. Um, and if you look at the first lead open counter, you can see that uh, the, this value remains uh, the same for a period that is way longer than the duration of a device address. So uh, this could be used to link two consecutive uh, random addresses. Same thing for the battery level. Uh, it, has, it, it stays the same for a period that is longer than the duration of uh, 15 minutes used by the random address. So based on the artifact broadcasted inside those uh, messages, uh, it becomes kind of trivial to link um, consecutive addresses uh, of uh, a device. And so you can defeat the purpose of address randomization and you can track a device and its owner over time. So, but there are other examples of uh, issues in, uh, in the paper. Second thing uh, I want to talk about is how we can spy on smart home activity uh, thanks to the messages emitted by uh, smart home appliances. So Apple has introduced uh, HomeKit, so it's a framework for smart home. Uh, it's used by Apple devices, but also by uh, other vendors. Um, and each device using this framework is periodically transmitting, broadcasting um, continuity messages in which you have a global state number. And this global state number um, is basically um, a counter uh, that uh, follows the state of the device. So whenever the state of your device changes, this counter will be incremented. So whenever, for instance, in the case of a light bulb, whenever you turn it on or off, the global state number of your light bulb will be incremented. So by observing the evolution of the global state number, you will be able to see if there is any activity inside the house and you can see uh, which devices are used by the occupants. So it's pretty invasive. So to test, uh, to see how we can do that, we conducted a small experiment in which we had uh, a smart light bulb and a presence detector. And we both placed them inside our office uh, and we monitored the messages from outside the room and observed what uh, we managed to, to get. And this was pretty obvious. Uh, so here I'm presenting the, the, the evolution of the global state number. So each spike here represents a change in the global state number, either for the motion sensor or the light bulb. And you can see that uh, based on this, uh, uh, indicators, you can uh, see when we arrive at the office, uh, when we leave the office, uh, the, also the lunch break we had uh, uh, during the day. Uh, and you can even uh, detect uh, when the janitor is entering the office early in the morning. Um, so uh, by remotely and passively uh, listening to Billy messages, you can have a quite good idea of uh, if there is someone inside a, a smart home and what this person is uh, is doing, so it's a bit uh, it's a bit scary. And of course, all these messages are broadcasted in clear, so there is uh, no security to break here. All right. Um, a third point I want to discuss is the cases of uh, the airdrop uh, messages and nearby action used for Wi-Fi credential sharing, in which we found that there are uh, identifiers that are included. So those identifiers are not included in clear, they are hashed. Uh, and why do they include identifiers in there? Uh, it's for uh, friendly device identification. So for instance, if you want to send a file to uh, the device of a, of a friend uh, before establishing the connection, uh, the devices will make sure that the owner knows each other. So you will send your identifier and the recipients will look up inside the contact list to see if there is a matching identifier, so if you know the person. 
So those identifiers are not sent in clear. As I said, they are hashed using SHA-256 and then later on they are truncated either to 16 bits in the case of airdrop or 24 bits in the case of nearby action for the Wi-Fi credential sharing. The problem is, uh, as you know, that hashing is not uh, a good way to protect um, identifiers. In fact, uh, many words have shown that you can reverse this hashing using a guesswork. Basically, it's a brute force attack in which you try all the possible identifiers. And this is uh, what we try to evaluate uh, using hypothetical attacks. So we did not perform these attacks. We just uh, uh, estimate the cost and the success rate of those attacks. So um, we uh, considered uh, hypothetical sets of phone numbers and email addresses of various sizes. And we computed the amount of time that it would take to test uh, all the values. As well, uh, there is an author, another thing to consider is the number of matches. Uh, because um, when you uh, compute the hash, you only you fall back to either 16 bits or 24 bits. So it's a, for in the case of 16 bits in particular, it's quite a small set. It's 250 um, to the power of 16 uh, different values. Um, which means that if you have a set that is larger than that, uh, you can have ambiguity. So several identifiers matching the same uh, hash. So you will not know which of them is the correct one. So we evaluated those two metrics. Uh, so first, the guesswork time, uh, the attack time is, I mean, pretty easy to achieve. In the worst case, we have a computation time of one hour. Uh, and uh, in the best case, it's less than one second. Um, but also we looked, so computation is not a problem. The only problem is the number of hashes that will uh, match. So in the case of a 16-bit identifier, uh, you have a matching set that is quite large. Uh, so for instance, you can have more than uh, 70,000 matching identifiers, which is not very practical. But if you have 24 bits, uh, you have much smaller sets uh, that can be used to narrow down your, your search. So for instance, you can try uh, all the phone numbers registered, uh, the landline phone numbers. Uh, in average, you will have only two matches uh, with the 24-bit uh, um, um, the, the, the identifier broadcasted by the nearby actions. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, if you looked at uh, smaller sets like uh, uh, for email addresses, like the, the users inside a university department, like 7,000 users, uh, here uh, you will have only uh, one uh, match that will happen. So this shows that depending on the, so depending on the, the set of the size, uh, it will, you will be more or less successful at uh, identifying uniquely uh, the, the user. Uh, in practice, uh, this shows that you need to uh, prepare your work and to target a bit your user. But uh, for instance, if you are in a small group, that is uh, quite uh, easy to do. And the last point uh, I'm going to briefly discuss is the case of uh, Siri uh, messages. Um, so Siri is the voice assistant used by Apple. Um, and uh, we discovered that uh, whenever you talk to your uh, device, your phone, um, whenever you send a command to your phone, your phone in parallel will send, uh, will broadcast a continuity message in which you have a hash, a perceptual hash of the voice command you've just spoken. So um, these perceptual hashes are not like cryptographic hashes in the sense that if there is a small variation in the input, so a small variation in your command, there will be a small variation inside the hash or sometime if the variation is small enough, there will be no changes at all. Uh, so it's basically those perceptual hashes, uh, they are used to identify um, comments uh, like uh, voices or images uh, to yeah, this kind of um, signal identification. Uh, and so how it works is whenever you send uh, a voice comment, it will take the audio signal as input, put it through the perceptual hash, and I'll put the 16-bit hash that will be uh, included inside the message. So again, as for the email addresses and phone numbers in the previous section, uh, here we could uh, try to see if based on the hash that is sent 
uh, inside the Bluetooth messages, if we could try to reverse it to the original um, to the original comment that was spoken by the user. This means that you don't need to listen to the voice comment, but you can be outside the house, listen to uh, Bluetooth uh, messages and try to pick up uh, those perceptual hash and try to infer what was the comment spoken by the user. So we try to do that. Uh, the results are not uh, great at the uh, for now. Uh, the problem is that 16 bits hash is quite small. So again, there is a lot of ambiguity, but if you can shortlist the number of comments that you want to, to test, uh, it, it is interesting. So um, the performances are not, as I say, not great, but uh, I believe we could improve that. Uh, and you could um, infer what is spoken inside the house just by listening to the voice comments. <coughs> the voice, uh, <coughs> sorry, the, the barely messages sent by um, uh, your Siri device. All right, this was the last attack I um, was going to talk about. Now let's move to the conclusion. <coughs> so in this work, we presented a, a full reverse engineering of uh, the Apple continuity protocols and we found that they were affected by a large number of privacy issues. Uh, here I'm only presented four of them, but they are way more than that. Uh, so it includes uh, tracking, inferring uh, smartphone activity, discovering email and phone numbers. And the bad news is that all those messages, they, all those issues, they are affecting a pretty large number of devices. So all the devices of Apple are affected, but also devices um, of affiliated companies, uh, which we estimate around 1.5 uh, billion devices worldwide. Uh, this is uh, another example that uh, security by obscurity does not work. So they've uh, created their own protocols um, and they try to include some protection, but they were not, uh, we believe, properly reviewed. And so they have many, uh, many issues. So maybe they were hoping that by uh, not disclosing how the protocol were, were working, maybe uh, nobody will find um, problems. Uh, you may be interested in uh, passing those uh, messages if you want to pass uh, the BLE messages that are your devices are sending. Uh, you can download the software we have uh, released. Uh, using that, you will be able to see in uh, Wireshark uh, the details of uh, all the messages, understand what your device are, are saying uh, over Bluetooth Low Energy. And it's quite uh, quite easy easy to do with a Bluetooth dongle. So, Try to do that and, and have fun. Um, before finishing, I want to mention that, um, of course, uh, we notified uh, Apple in, in advance, so in May 2019, about that, just before we submitted the, the first version of our paper. Uh, so they received our notification and they, they acknowledged it. Uh, but we uh, noticed that they haven't fixed many things and nothing at all, actually. Uh, most of the attacks are still valid um, as of today. Uh, we made recommendation how they could reduce some of these attacks. They did not consider it. Um, so the question is, why, is, uh, why are those uh, problems still around? Uh, maybe they are too difficult to correct. Uh, for instance, um, HomeKit protocols, so they are inside um, smart home appliances. And as you know, Internet of Things, uh, updating uh, the, the firmware is not something that is done often. Uh, so changing the protocol will break all those uh, devices. So this is maybe why they haven't done it, at least for the HomeKit protocol. Uh, or uh, maybe the problem were, was not serious enough. Um, so uh, since we notified this, there were uh, more than 10 updates that have been done on iOS and only one specific issue has been corrected. Uh, I think it's the, something to do with the battery level. I need to check again. But all the other problems, they are still around. Um, so yeah. Apple is not, uh, I mean, Apple is often advertising that they are very careful about the privacy of their users. But uh, here we have a good example that maybe um, 
it's just uh, yeah, it's just what they say and not what they do. All right, uh, this is the end of my presentation. Um, so I want to point to the original paper from which this presentation is extracted. Uh, though this paper has been published at uh, the conference uh, PETS uh, in 2020. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about it, if you have any idea to share with us, uh, please get in touch with us uh, using the following email um, addresses. Okay, thank you, Mathieu, for, for, for the, the great talk. Um, I, I, will, I will start with a few questions. Uh, how long does it take to, to do all this uh, fancy uh, analysis of, of the, the Bluetooth energy? Um, actually, uh, it didn't take that much time. Uh, once Guillaume um, identified uh, the possibilities uh, offered by, I mean, the, the, the three methods uh, that we discovered, especially the one with the disassembly, it was uh, pretty quick. Um, uh, it was discovering the thing was not so long then. Doing some experiments uh, were a bit longer. But I think in total, we worked uh, maybe a, a month full time uh, doing the, the practical thing. And then there was, of course, the writing of the paper. May I ask a second question is about uh, the, the tracing aspect. You, you, you have a possibility to, to, to identify who, who is uh, moving with the blue to low energy. And uh, you, you say that adding a random is not enough, if I understood correctly, because you have extra kind of side channel or other information that can identify the person. Uh, but you didn't propose any idea of uh, countermeasure. What should we do for avoiding this? Because I think it's, it's a vanish problem. Yeah. So yeah, the, the problem I've mentioned is uh, pretty common in a uh, wireless network that implements um, address organization. So um, Bluetooth, low energy is doing it. Uh, Wi-Fi is also uh, doing it. So some vendors are implementing it in Wi-Fi. So the address is changing randomly. But um, as you said, and as I've showed uh, with a specific example in a presentation, uh, if there are other elements inside the frame uh, that can be used to uh, link to consecutive addresses, I mean, you basically, uh, I mean, kill the address normalization purpose. Um, and so, Several works I've been looking at. So there is a group of researchers, including myself and others, uh, that have been working on this topic for now more than six years. And we came up with a pretty uh, simple list of recommendations. Actually, there is uh, now a, um, a document I actually believe for, for specifically for the Wi Fi standard that gives a number of rules that should be implemented. Uh, those rules are quite simple to implement, but uh, like for instance, uh, if you have counters in your frame, you need to reset them to a random value whenever you change your address. Uh, this is one thing. And also you should not obviously include other identifiers uh, in this frame. And if you include identifiers, you need to rotate them at the same time as you rotate your device address. Um, so you, you need to do that. I mean, the requirements are quite simple to express, but in practice, um, they are the first the vendors that do not uh, consider those issues that make uh, st I mean, stupid mistakes. Uh, and then there are vendors that are aware of the problem and try to do something. Um, this is the case of Apple, not uh, in this um, specific uh, protocols, um, but uh, you may be aware of the um, contact tracing application that have been released uh, recently to, um, to, to try to limit the spread of the, the virus. Uh, and Apple and Google, they, they presented, uh, they, they've introduced their, their own system in which they have, um, they also use Bluetooth energy to transmit identifiers. So there is the Bluetooth uh, address that is used and inside the, the packets, there is an identifier used for contact tracing. And they thought of, okay, we need to rotate those two at the same time. It's part of the specification and they actually do it inside in their implementation. But in fact, they, try to do it, but sometimes the synchronization is not exact and there is a small overlap and it breaks everything. Um, so there is a paper uh, from Vodne and Vanu uh, on this um, on this topic, no, not the paper, actually a video. I can send the link a bit later. Uh, that shows that this is happening. So it shows that 
the rules are simple, but even uh, the vendors that are controlling fully the OS, they are not capable of doing it, implementing correctly the synchronous uh, rotation of those identifiers. So yeah, we need to work more on that, uh, on the implementation and the verification side. Okay, thanks. Uh, one quick question, so two questions that I will uh, summarize in one. Uh, it's about the voice command uh, on Siri. Does it recognize any sound and can you get the command of the victim uh, voice? So uh, it does not recognize any sound. So you need to start uh, to trigger this mechanism. You need to start initiating you saying, hey, Siri, to your computer. Uh, to your smartphone or, or whatever. And then it will record uh, a short sequence. Uh, and from this short sequence of uh, voice, it will compute the hash. Um, but like I said, 16 bits is not a lot. Um, so we performed an experiment in which we had um, a dictionary of comment, spoken comment that we spoke in front of the of the, the Siri. We recorded the, the hash and we tried to later on recognize which comment was spoken. And we found out that, uh, yes, because there are a variation in the voice and also because the, the sets of the different ashes is small, there are a lot of collisions. So sometimes um, you may confuse. So for instance, if I say, hey Siri, uh, call Mary, uh, can be confused to, hey Siri, call Mark. Uh, so you can infer if you know uh, if you have a short list of comments you could recognize which comment uh, is sent but if you have no idea of the comments that can be sent to your Siri assistant uh, it may be more complicated okay thank you Mathieu uh, we'll now go to the next talk uh, given by David bye 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 <laughs>